Hi, welcome to Living Hope. You know, here we really love Jesus, we love to worship and, and pray for one another, and we really love the Word of God. Now, all that is about to start, so we're glad that you're with us. Father, we are so grateful for every good thing. God, for Paige's testimony, for Chastity's testimony, for Kelly's testimony. You're doing wonderful things in the lives of people that you love. And I thank you, Lord, that you love us. I thank you that you love every person, every soul. And God, we ask that you would continue to move. We ask that you would um, continue to change us and that you would use us to change and, and to bring change and the same kind of help and hope and love to the people of this community. Lord, please, in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Uh, so we've been involved in possessing, we've been talking about possessing our inheritance, and it's one way of looking at it. It's of, of uh, the things that God has for us, and that can sound really self-serving. It can say, you know, gimme, 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 uh, can, can kind of ring through that, but that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is a loving God who has made tremendous provision for his children for the purpose of blessing them, us, so that we can then bless others. That's really what we're talking about. God has given, imagine you discovered that you had a rich great great uncle that you had never heard of who passed away in Timbuktu and you're his sole inheritor and all of a sudden you have this amazing inheritance but there's a caveat attached and that's that he wants you to give half of it away. <coughs> That's a real hardship, right? Yeah, here's $30 million, and you can have it, provided you agree to give $15 million of it away. I could live with that. I could live with that. And that's really what we have. We have an inheritance from God because he's a good God who loves us, and the caveat is it's not just for us, but it's for us to share. So Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11 we discovered that because we are united with Christ, we celebrated three people today who were not united to Christ because we're not born united to Christ, but who found Christ and are now united with him. And if, if that's your experience, if you know Jesus, this includes you. Because we are united with Christ, we have an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance and he makes everything work out according to his plan. The Old Testament has such an exciting uh, display for us in the lives of Moses and the Israelites as God freed them from Egypt and wanted to take them into the promised land. The promised land was the inheritance that, uh, that God promised to Abraham and to his descendants. And now Moses and the children of Israel have been freed from Egypt, which is a picture of us being freed from the world. They've been freed from slavery, which is a picture of us being freed from sin. And they have been taken, they have taken, uh, God's led them to the edge of the promised land, and they're supposed to go into the promised land. However, uh, when they get there, this is, this is what they end up saying. They say, the land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. These are the 10 of the 12 spies who went in to see what the land was like. They came back with a report for all of Israel. It's a really, really great land, but the land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were, were uh, next to them. We felt like grasshoppers and that's what they thought too. Some of my got, uh, got cut out of here on my, on my sheet. That's the kind of morning it's been actually. We even saw the descendants of Anak who were giants and next to them we looked like grasshoppers. We thought we looked like grasshoppers and they thought we looked like grasshoppers too is what he's saying there. But we had two guys, Caleb and Joshua, who said something entirely different. They saw the same thing that the other ten spies saw they saw, they saw the identical set of circumstances, the same land, the same fruit, the same cities, the same giants. But instead of saying, oh my gosh, we're so small, we can't possibly do this, this is what they said. They said to all the people of Israel, the land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into that land and give it to us. It is rich land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord. 
And do not be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless prey to us. The other ten spies are saying, oh, these giants are going to kill us. And J Jake, uh, Caleb and Joshua are saying, kill us? Are you kidding? They are prey to us. We got God on our side. They, like these guys, these guys don't stand a chance. It's, it's sort of like, you know, a guy in a, in a uh, Chicago Bulls basketball game who scored three points. And uh, the total score of the game, they, there was something like 137 points, and he had scored three of them. And he said, uh, yeah, between Michael Jordan and I, we scored 137 points. <laughs> it's, it's sort of like that. They're saying, hey, us and the Lord. These guys don't have a chance. He says, don't be afraid of the people of that. They are helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Just in review, the issue... What we've been talking about is we've been asking ourselves this question, who are you really? Are you a grasshopper or are you a giant killer? The fact is, even if you see yourself as a grasshopper, that's not true. God says that you're a giant killer. The Word of God says that you are a giant killer. The problem that the people had they're perched on the very edge of the promised land. They were supposed to go in and take the land. The problem that they saw, the problem that they had, was all between this ear and this ear. It was all in their head. It was all determined by how they thought and how they saw things. How did they see God? Did they see him big enough to make this happen? Ten didn't. Two did. How did they see themselves? Did they see themselves as people who could be empowered by God to get the inheritance, to get what he had promised them? And 10 of them said, uh-uh, we aren't that kind of people. We are grasshoppers beside these giants. Two of them saw it differently and said, are you kidding? We, <laughs> we're going to have giants for breakfast. We're going to wash it down with grape juice. This is, we, we're, we're winners. We have God on our side. God said we're going to do this thing. And so we're going to do this thing. And so what we've been talking about is how do we change how we think? If you don't, if you don't consider yourself a giant killer, I'm going to be asking you, and I've actually asked a number of weeks, I'm going to be asking you again, what's your giant? What is it that would keep you from enjoying the fullness of your inheritance? What kind of issues exist in your life that would make it difficult for you to be able to reach out and take what God has given you? All of the issues are between the ears. It's, it's in how we see, it's in how we think. Uh, are we, the Israel considered, they, they acted like they were still slaves, but they'd been set free. But they acted like they were still slaves instead of thinking that they were free. Uh, we can, at the same time, think that we're still slaves. We are still just like the person we used to be. We still have all the issues we always had. We're still, you know, we're very much slaves when the Word of God says that you've been made new. The Word of God says that I can put off the old man, which is in slavery. I can be renewed in the spirit of my mind, and I can put on this new man, who Christ has made me, who Christ, um, what, what he has given me, and who he has made me. Um, last week, we started to walk through a process, or a couple weeks ago, I guess it was, we started to walk through the process of how, how we could do this. We said, really, there, there are four steps. Um, and I mean, I... I'm really not one for a do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, and everything will work out right. But it helps us think. It helps us see that, you know, there are actually things that we can do to achieve this. And so whether I've got the order exactly right or sometimes there's overlap or sometimes things work different for you, that's fine. But we said there really there are four things. There's justification, there is revelation, there is impartation, and then there is transformation. Justification, again, that's what God has already done for us in Christ. Can't be undone. We didn't do it. We weren't responsible for it. We get all the benefit from it, but it's what he has already done for us. That's God's part. But then we need to follow that up by seeking him for revelation. Um, by revelation, we mean God making real to us what really is real. When I see something in, that the Word of God says about me, and I think, well, that's what the Bible says, but it sure ain't working. 
What I need is revelation. I need, I need to get God himself to show me how it works. All right? Um, then what happens is impartation, and actually that revelation comes largely through, you can see those three red boxes up there, through investigation, finding what the Bible says, through meditation, which is taking what the Bible says and digesting it. And just going over it and over it, memorize it, think about it, go over it, go over it, go over it. And then, um, and then declaration, which means to really begin to speak what the Word of God says. I'm still bouncing pretty good, Scott. I don't know if I am back there or not, but thanks. Then impartation, which is what happens when we add faith to the revelation. When God speaks to us, we go, oh. Then we add faith to that, and he begins to impart it into our lives. We're going to talk about that in a way that is more understandable in just a second. Um, I want to ask again, what is your giant? What, what issue exists in your life that you just go, you know what, I know the Bible says that God has got something better for me in this area, whether it's freedom in some area or... Um, uh, the ability to do something, uh, to pray for the sick. I mean, there are all kinds of things that God says that we can do. What is your giant? If, if you could be in front of God right this moment and him say, well, like he said to the blind man, what do you want me to do for you? I mean, Jesus did that a number of times. Somebody, somebody who was blind or, or someone who had leprosy, they would come to him, and I mean, their need was obvious, but he would say, what do you want me to do? Because people don't always see what their need is. People don't always see what their giant is. And so this morning, I'd like to ask you that question. What's your giant? If, if, if Jesus said to you, what can I do for you? What would your answer be to him? What's, what's the giant that you need slain? What comes between revelation and impartation? Again, by revelation, I mean God taking the truth that he has in his word and making it personal to you, giving you personal understanding, giving you light to really grasp that this is true. What, what happens um, between revelation and impartation? And um, what we're going to, what we're going to talk about is we got lots of shuns in here. It helps me remember. I don't know if it helps you remember at all. But it's appropriation, which means exercising faith, which means reaching out and actually getting this thing. Um, I don't think the gospel is complicated. I don't think getting our inheritance is a complicated thing. I think it, it just it comes through us getting it, through, through us... Um, hearing something from God and going, yeah, okay. That's where the greatest success in life comes from that I'm aware of, uh, is, is hearing God, letting him give us revelation, and going, oh, okay. And it works something like this. This is just a simple way for me to remember it. I get it in my head. God gives light, and you go, oh, I get it. I get it. And then you reach out the hand of faith, and you get it. And then once you get it, you got it. Scott, that is just too simple to be even worth saying anything about. No, I, for me, this is, this is how it works. I ask God to show me. I find out, okay, what's, what's the issue? What's the issue? Let, let me tell you some of the issues I've been through in my life. A couple of weeks ago, I shared with you how God freed me from smoking many, many years ago. Didn't happen until I went, oh, I get it. I not only understand I should and it's good for me, but I get it. I could see how it can happen. Then you reach out your hand of faith and say, okay, God, I choose. I choose that. I believe. And you know what happens when you do that? You get it. <laughs> you've got it. You get it. You get it. You've got it. 
that, that just may sound silly to you, and I'm sorry. And I'm, if I'm going by the looks on your faces, I've wasted the last two minutes of your time. But that's how simple this is. You wait on God, you ask God, you, you, you find out what the Word of God says, and then you get it. It happened for me in, in that area of addiction. It happened for me um, what, when, I, when I realized who I am in Jesus, when I realized who I am in Christ. It became part of me. So I got it. I decided, yeah, okay, I'm going to believe that. I took it. I got it. And now I've got it. Now it is part of me. I don't have to get that every day. I've got it. Um, I, I grew up... Uh, the way I grew up and my temperament and everything, I, I struggled in early years as a Christian. I'm a people pleaser. That's not a great thing when you're a pastor, to be a people pleaser. It's hard to lead when you're trying to make everybody happy. I'll cast the devil right out of that thing. <laughs> <laughs> so once I realized, okay, I got, God gave me revelation on it. And he said, Scott, you don't have... I have this basically, I'm using my own words, which is typically how I describe what God says to me. But he said, I have good news for you. All these people that you're trying to make happy, you don't have to. You don't have to. You only have to make one person happy, and it's me. Can I tell you it's easier to make one person happy than 300? <laughs> it's way easier. And so that's all I have to focus on. He said it. I got it. Then I had to make a choice and say, but God, I've been, I've been trying to people please my whole life. No, as an act of faith, you say, okay, I will do that. I will let you change, make that change in me. And so you get it. You get it, and you get it, and then you've got it. I, I will tell you what my big revelation of the last two years is. I've been serving the Lord since 1977. I've been pastoring in some form or another since 1977. And it's maybe the last two years where I really feel like God is opening up revelation and I'm going, oh my goodness. God is good. God is good. He's only good. He's only ever good. There's no anything that's not good in him at any time. He is good and he is infinitely good. I'm getting this by revelation all of a sudden. I've, I've said it since 1977. But all of a sudden I'm going, oh, he really is good. And so I get it. But then I have to, by faith, get it. So I'm going to pray differently. I'm going to believe differently. I'm going to expect things from him differently. I'm going to expect him to lead me differently than I ever did before by faith. And I'm getting it. I get it. I get it. I get it. What am I, what am I talking about? Well, if you take one thing away this morning, it's this. It takes faith. The key is to hear from God. Let him make what's in here real to you. And then to choose to believe it. Yes. That's faith. You have to choose to believe it. Because where is our problem? It's between here and here. That's why we need our minds renewed. That's why we need to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. Because the problem is between here and here. Faith is choosing. Hebrews chapter 4 well, let's just say a couple of things about faith here. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 11 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. What you really, what you have joyous expectation of, that's hope. God speaks in, and, and there's substance comes to it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. This is a work of God in you. It's not simply, okay, I'll believe. There's a work of God that happens, and then you choose to believe what he's saying. He has a part, you have a part. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, this is a strong verse. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without me deciding, without me deciding to believe him, without me deciding to think his way, without me making a decision that, yes, I will be who you want me to be, I can't please him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. 
Romans chapter 10 and verse 7, and this just, again, reinforces the whole need for revelation for us to be able to learn how to hear from God ourselves. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 says this is, this is where faith comes from. Faith comes from hearing, and hearing comes from the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes from the Word of God. Now, reading your Bible will help a whole lot. Uh, studying your Bible will help a whole lot. Memorizing parts of the Bible will help you a whole lot. But when it says that faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God, the word there is the rhema word. It's not simply what's written, but it's what he's saying. So you need to hear to his vo You need to learn to hear his voice to get revelation. When I get revelation, I, that, that gives me faith, and then I can choose to believe what he's showing me. Scott, you know you've been saying the same thing for weeks, right? Yes, I know. Are you getting it? Are you getting it? Because, because we need to get this. If we're going to get our inheritance, if we're going to be able to really appropriate the things that God has given us, we need to get this. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 2, um, God is actually describing, he's talking about the Israelites perched at the edge of the wilderness, going to go into the promised land, and they blew it. An entire generation is lost in the wilderness because they did not believe God. This is what Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2 says. They did not enter into the rest that he had for them because they didn't mix it with faith. There's got to be a choice. There's got to be a reaching out. There's got to be a hearing God and saying, yes, sir, this is what I want. This is, I want what you want. I'm going to reach out and I'm going to take it. Let me quickly run through some things that I do by faith. Before I do, let me ask you this question one more time, one last time. What is your giant? See, I want to give you some homework. I want you to identify what your giant is. My giant is depression. Nope. I, or, sorry, not no. <laughs> that's not my giant. But you, your giant might be depression. Your giant might be hopelessness. Your giant might be sickness. Your giant might be timidity. I, I, I want to tell people about Jesus, but I can't tell people about Jesus. Your giant, we could have a whole bunch of different giants in this room. But my question is, what is your giant? And here's the homework I want to give you. Kill it. Kill it. Find out what the Bible says about that thing. Find out what the Bible says about you and that thing. Memorize it. Meditate on it. Let God begin to speak to you about it. And then exercise faith and say, okay, God, this is what you say. This is what I'll believe. This is how I'll live. This is how I'll think. And get your mind renewed. I have something in my notes here that I was going to skip, but I, I, I don't want to. You want to kill your giant? Do you want to fight a giant? I dare you. I dare you. I double dog dare you <laughs> to take up this challenge. I triple dog dare you to take up this challenge and to learn through it. it, it might, you might just do it as an exercise, but you will learn so much in doing it, and you're going to be able to apply it to all kinds of things that would keep you from being able to, to gain your inheritance and walk in your inheritance and then share that inheritance with other people. So by faith, real fast, let's look at this. By faith, I decide to find out what God says. That may sound real simple, but you know what? That's an actual... That's an actual act of faith. Because you know what's going to happen? We're going we're, we're to close the service and you're going to go get a cookie. <laughs> okay. Don't. There's application here. Decide that you're going to do it. Uh, if you're following on your notes, there's a blank there. This is the word that you fill in that blank. Lumps don't inherit. Lumps don't inherit. Just sitting in a chair won't get you anywhere. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Be diligent... To, to be approved to God. Be diligent. You've got to put, you put effort into this thing. By faith, I discover what he says. Um, there are multiple study aids that are available. You can, you can speak into your phone and say, Siri, what does the Bible say about depression? 
Siri, what does the Bible say about eating disorders? Siri, what does the Bible say about being cranky? <laughs> you know, you could, whatever your giant is, it's there. There are multiple things online. There are tools we have. We have home groups that deal with this kind of stuff. Um, Con and Yuli, I visited their home group this week. They're dealing with uh, how to love your kids on purpose. Great teaching, great stuff, great group. It was so practical. I sat at a table with four ladies, and every one of them was raving about this study giving them tools to use and how, how good it is. Those things are fantastic, but you still have to do them. And when it comes to searching out the, the solution to your giant, you're very capable of doing that. You need to do it. Find out what it is. Uh, one of the frustrations that the author of Hebrews had in Hebrews chapter 5, he said, you know what? By now, a whole bunch of you should be teachers. And I'm still feeding you pablum, really, is what he said. But you've been at this long enough. You should be teachers. Should you be a teacher? Have you been at this long enough that you should be discipling other people? Can I say something really controversial? <laughs> If you've known Jesus more than about six months, the answer is yes. If you've known Jesus for about six months, you can start to help other people. And so get some giants under your belt in order to do that. By faith, I meditate on what he says. I meditate on what he says by faith. Um, David killed his giant, right? David killed Goliath, and uh, I love it because he goes through the whole rigmarole of trying on Saul's armor and that's not going to work. And, and so he goes and he gets these five, do you know why he got five stones? David was a giant killer. Because when you read further in the Bible, you find out Goliath had four brothers. That's why he took five stones. He only needed one. So he goes and he goes out to, to, to fight Goliath. Goliath sees this 15, 16 year old kid, whatever he was, and he sees them. Goliath is eight and a half, nine, nine foot four. Okay, and, and he's up there, and he's got all this armor, and here's this kid, no armor, and a sling, and a staff. I, have, I don't know why he had his staff with him, but he had his staff with him. And, uh, and he goes out there, and Goliath says, what am I, a dog that you said send this to kill me? And this is what David said to him. You come to me with weapons and an army. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, and I... I'm going to kill you, and then I'm going to cut your head off, and then all your soldiers are going to get slain and eaten by the birds. <laughs> Family show. <laughs> <laughs> um, David already knew what was going to happen. David wasn't just hoping. He knew. He had pictured what would take place already. He had visualized it. I know what's going to happen. Faith is seeing what will happen when God shows up. Faith is seeing what will happen when God does what God says he's going to do. Your experience will always catch up to what you believe. And I'm not saying, okay, so I'll believe it right now, and it happens. No, that's magic. That's not kingdom. That's magic, and magic doesn't work. Okay? But you get your thinking right, you get your believing right, you hear from God, you choose to believe what God says, your experience will follow. The time in between is just is called faith. So David knew that this was going to happen. So David meditated on it, and that's just such a, a key thing. By faith, I hear what he says. Faith comes by hearing, hearing comes by the word of God. By faith, I choose to believe what he says. Faith is the hand that reaches out and takes what God uh, and, and takes what God is giving. And then there's another step. And this one really, I'm, I'm just learning. I, I'm, kinda, I'm, a, I'm an infant in this. By faith, I declare what he says. By faith, I put my mouth in agreement with what the Bible says. Now, I'm not talking about magic. I'm not talking about, I'm going to have a million dollars. I'm going to get a check in the mail tomorrow. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about finding out what the Word of God says and to begin to declare it, begin to speak as though it's true because it is. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm a fairly, I don't know, it's not a biblical term, but let me use it. I'm a fairly happy-go-lucky kind of guy. 
I I'm have God gave me a positive nature and and um, I've always been really blessed with that. And I know that some of you have really had seasons or maybe in a season now of really struggling with depression. Um, I just know that that's one of the most difficult giants there is to beat. But I want to tell you something. You can, you can do it. He can do it. He can do it. But I woke up one day just under some really ugly depression. And, and so not only was it ugly, I'm not used to it. It's sort of like I never get headaches, so when I get them, I'm just like a, a whine. Like I'm, I find it hard to take. Uh, but I got up really depressed. It was just ugly. And I got here to have my prayer time, and I got out the booklet, the, one, the booklet, Who Are You Really, that, that we put out. Uh, I just got it out, and I'm, I'm way down here. And I just started at number one, and I started to declare, boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, and I just started to declare what the Bible says about me. I started to declare what the Word of God says about me. And it just, at about number 15, I got up to about here. At about number 30, I got up to here. About num by number 40, I was fine. I was great. Why? Because I started to put my thinking in line, and, and a tool for putting my thinking in line with what the Word of God says was to put my mouth in action. Um, you say, well, Scott, can you, you, you really shouldn't, say these things until they're true. Well, see, the fact is, they are true. What the Bible says about you, it is true. Okay, I get up one day, and I, I imagine this happens, because it would never, ever happen. I imagine that Kelly gave me a funny look before I left in the morning. And so I, I get here, and I'm, I, don't, I don't think she loves me. I don't, I don't know, I think, I think Kelly thinks I'm awful. I think, I think Kelly thinks I'm a scumbag. Oh no, my wife doesn't love me anymore. Well, the fact is, it's, she does love me. She really does. Now, if I don't feel like she does, that doesn't determine reality, she does. So if I just start saying, <laughs> Kelly loves me, <laughs> Kelly loves me, Kelly, oh, Kelly loves me, oh, Kelly, Kelly loves me, oh, Kelly, Kelly. <laughs> Hi, honey, how are you? <laughs> right? <laughs> what happens when I declare it, it kind of lines things up on the inside and brings them to the outside. When I make a declaration, when I say, I am a new creature, when I say, my mind is being renewed so I can be the new man, when I say, I may feel horrible, but by his stripes I am healed, and so I am beginning to feel better now, and I know that God has undertaken for me, and I start going through... I begin to declare what the Word of God says. It's a huge, huge help. It's not the answer, but it's a part of the answer. And so I, I, I just want to encourage you, and it's an act of faith, and it engages so much more. It engages my imagination, it engages my emotions, it engages my testimony. I just have a couple of stories to tell. To, to challenge you, I'm hoping. It, maybe if we get the worship team, if you guys could come on back up and we'll, we'll end our morning with worship. Um, on the bottom of your outline, if you're using the paper outline, it says, what could keep you from appropriating your inheritance that is now yours in Jesus? What could keep you from that? And I, and I, and I was thinking, what kind of how could we possibly want to be defeated? How could we possibly be happy saying, no, I'm, that's good for you, but I'm going back to the wilderness. Thanks very much. Why would I want to do that? What kind of issues? And there could be lots. I might just be lazy. I might live in the wilderness just because I'm really just too lazy to do anything about it. Can I repeat, lumps don't inherit. It's just not a great idea. <laughs> Maybe I just don't care enough about other people. Maybe, yeah, I don't need that 30 million. I don't need it. I, I'm good with, with 50,000 a year. I don't need that 30 million. Really, the idea is, is for us to get so we can give, for us to live in change so that we can take it to others. But I sometimes think that out of self-preservation, there's a... There's a, um, anybody besides me fight with denial sometimes? I don't really, I don't really have a problem. What's that? 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah, if you did raise your hand, you're probably in denial. That's, that's true. <laughs> I mean, I can't tell you, I can't tell you. And, and if you think I'm picking on you, I'm not, because I've done this with probably 20 different people. You know, so if, if I've done it with you, I'm sorry, it was such a good illustration. Okay. Say, so, uh, why don't you deal with your anger issue? I don't have an anger issue, right? Why, why, why don't you deal with your lazy issue? I don't really want to answer that. Uh, what, you know, what, it's so easy to be in denial. One of my favorite, I was going to show it for you this morning, um, but I decided that even though the blood is all in fun, it's a little too gory for you. But I wanted to, sh to do the clip from Monty Python and the, and the Holy Grail. <laughs> 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 And King Arthur is looking for knights for his round table. And he, he rides up. He, they don't have horses, right? They just go like this, and his servant has coconuts, and he's <laughs> And they come up, and here's these two knights fighting with these big, long swords, and boom, boom, and they're having this great big battle, and the one knight kills the other one. And Arthur comes up, and he says, Great knight, I can see that you are worthy. I am looking for knights for my round table, and you, I've seen your honor and your skill. Would you join? He won't answer him, won't answer him, won't answer him. No, do you not hear me? Won't answer him, won't answer him. Finally, Arthur goes, okay, we're going to go by. And he starts to go by the, the, the black knight. He starts to go by him, and the black knight says, none shall pass. As I am Arthur, king of the Britons, I command you to stand aside. None shall pass. And so Arthur says, I'm going to go past, and you have to get out of my way, or I'll have to kill you. Mm, try me, says the black knight. So Arthur gets out his sword, and they have a bit of a sword fight, and whoop, Arthur lops off the guy's left arm. No left arm. Blood is shooting, like, <laughs> like out of the... The neck of a headless chicken, right? <laughs> and so then Arthur thinks it's over. The, the knight just picks up the sword with the other hand, and he starts, and so hard, da 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 da. They keep fighting, and whoop! Arthur lops off one of his legs. Now he's got one arm and one leg, and he's hopping and fighting now, like this. Finally, by the time it's over, this guy has no arms, no legs, stumpy. He's down, right? It's just he's just got a body and a head, and Arthur starts to go around him, and the guys go, "Come back!" I'm going to beat you. I'm going to beat you. I'm going to, I'm going to defeat you. And he just wouldn't, he just wouldn't quit, right? And, oh, I'm, and all the way through this, I mean, he's got no arms. And Arthur's going, you have no arms. He goes, no, it's just a flesh wound. <laughs> <laughs> I've cut off your legs. No, you haven't. No, you haven't. Come, come back here. I'll hit you with my head, you know? <laughs> and all the way through, he's going, no, it's just a flesh wound. I've done this to you. No, you haven't. No, you haven't. He's just in absolute denial. And I, you know what, the giants, sometimes our giants sing lullabies to us. They lull us to sleep, and they just, we start thinking, yeah, I don't really have an issue. No, there really isn't. There really isn't anything. Where I want to encourage you today is to say, okay, I know, I know, I have several giants. Well, most of us have a number of giants but I know the one that I really need to go after right now. And I want to encourage you to do it. I want to encourage you to not just hear the word, but be a doer of the word. I like to encourage you to say, you know what? I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to, I'm going to have a giant for breakfast and wash him down with grape juice. A friend once told me, and I actually found it kind of surprising, that a lot of people don't understand that they're welcome at church. Now, some people, he said, have the idea that church is like a, a club where you should be a member before you attend things. Well, we want you to know it's not like that, and we would love it if you could join us at Living Hope. 
We're on the corner of King and Kensington. We have services Sunday morning. You can check our website to, or check the newspaper for our service times. We'd love to have you come. Uh, apart from that though, we're glad that you are with us and hope that you'll join us again.